real quick. The control booth, I don't think, knows that I want to have it on the other thing, so they're probably switching it back to the computer, and then I switch it back to the laptop, and we'll do that probably the whole rest of the class. That'll be fun. Um, This is 4.4 is, is what I'm using, and I'm using Eclipse. We're going to eventually migrate over to do the examples uh, using Android Studio. Uh, I mean, the code's the same. The way it's organized, the way it looks is going to be a little different. So I wanted to do the first few that sort of match the book, to, the, thinking that that would uh, simplify it. And then as we get into um, the work, we can migrate over. All right, let's see here. All right, I should be able to do this perfectly. Is there a story behind what? Behind log cat? I don't see. Oh. It's, it's, yeah, it's probably it's probably it's some sort of log. Well, log is log, and 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 cat is everything on an, on the internet relates to cats. So, yeah. Okay, there are there are eight people here, and there's nine people in the class, and I know who's missing. So I do have attendance, but let me let me try it to to. To guess again, yeah. Oh man. Okay, Jesse, I know you. Did you guys have, growing up? Did you guys have romper room? Where? Yeah, exactly. They uh, and at the end, the hostess would go, like, would look through a magical mirror and, and say hi to all the kids. And I see Joey and Johnny, and that's why I feel like when I'm doing attendance. And it was funny because like. She saw Mike. She saw Mike. Well, like a third of the people in the world are named Mike, right? You know, so <laughs> she's going to see Mike pretty often. All right, Garrett. All right, Jesse, Garrett, Michelle. Martin is not here. Mark is here. Michael's here. And again, I really apologize to you folks. You didn't, you haven't done anything bad or anything. I just, I just am not remembering your name. Okay, but let me try to conclude it. T Terry. Okay. Charles and Andrew. All right. High five of myself. All right. Um, the one thing that we noticed last time is we will go through our tour of this. And when, when I want to look at something in detail, I'll bring it up into my text editor so we can make the font bigger and, and all that. But we noticed that really three places that we look for stuff in the Java code in the resource section, resource folder, and the manifest. The manifest, again, is information about the app. The main interesting thing about this is know what the main interesting thing is because it's not coming up. So we'll skip that one. Um, the resources. We looked at three kinds of them. Drawables, which would be 
graphics like the icon and, and other sorts of graphics. Um, layout and finally string values. So the string values contain all of the labels in our code. Oh, I moved a file around. I wonder if that is the problem. I moved stuff around. It might not be able to find it. Let me do something right away real quick. Created an empty folder because it thought that welcome was supposed to be there. Let me import it again from its new location, and we should be in business. I'm kind of a slob in real life, but I don't like having icons on my desktop. I just don't. And, and therefore, I like, if there's something on there, it's like, ooh, I have to move it off. And so I'm, I had these, this app on the desktop, and I moved it off, and we see what happened. All right, at any rate, back to this. Here's our manifest. And it contains interest, uh, information about the app, what the icon is, and so on. All right. The one thing of interest that I want you to be aware of is the activity, the activity name, welcome, that matches the name of my Java class, welcome.java. And this class, in fact, is of type activity. It extends activity. So it is an activity. So in a nutshell, what this says is when this app fires off, all right, this is the activity that you run. So that's the startup activity. So that kind of information is in the manifest. Uh, another thing that's in the manifest would be if there's special permission required. For example, if the app wrote to your memory, all right, or if your app needed an internet connection, or if your app wanted to interrupt phone calls, or let allow phone calls interrupted, or whatever. All these kinds of special permissions it does. If any of you have an Android, when you install an app, Oftentimes it shows you a screen saying, this app requests permission to do A, B, C, D, and so on. That way you know what you're getting into. All right? And then you pick it, and then you're, you're good to go. All right? The other thing it has is it has intent filters. We'll talk more about intents later on. Um, essentially, an application can have many actions associated with it. All right? Or uh, activities, rather. And it's at least going to have one activity, and you think of activity again as a screen that you're presenting to the user for them to do something. And it's going to have at least one main one, but it could have other ones as well. All right. So that's enough about the um, manifest. We'll look in future examples. We'll look and see if there's anything cool in any of them. Drawables are graphics. Layout is the UI, the user interface. And values are my string literals. Again, we put these in their own file to make it easier to change. All right. 
So we have a welcome message, or we have a label for a text box, or we have anything like that. We're not going to have it hard-coded in our code. We're going to refer to a string, um, a string element, a string value that's contained in this XML file. All right. The advantage of that is you can keep things consistent. Um, if uh, you have an application that uh, asks for a student number, and you have student number, then you decide student ID number is a better way to put it. If you change that value from student ID number, everywhere that use that value, automatically it gets changed. It gets uh, reflected across there. Another big advantage of this, as we said before, uh, as we said uh, last time, is that we have what are called resource qualifiers. And resource qualifiers are when you can say a resource folder is used under some special conditions. All right? And there's a whole mess of resource qualifiers. And there's like um, a precedence of like if you have more than one, which one goes first, and that sort of thing. All right. But the idea of the resource qualifier is that we can easily make our resources apply, use different resources in different situations. There's a whole list of them. All right. For example, the MCC is the mobile country code. All right? So we can go in and we can set things, properties based on the mobile country code. The language and region. All right? So we saw an example where we used FR for French. We can also take that further and talk about French Canadians versus French from France. All right? Or English in the United States versus English in the United Kingdom. All right? The layout direction. Again, certain cultures, things go in the other way, are oriented in the other way. So a, a book or whatever, the pages, words aren't going from, you know, from left to right. They go from right to left. So you can actually go in and orient it that way. Smallest width is the fundamental size of screen. Let's see what else. Available width, available height, screen size, screen aspect, round screen, screen orientation, UI mode. There's a whole mess of these. All right. Night mode. You can change it through the life of your application if night mode is left in auto mode, in which case the mode changes the time of day. So you could have your, you could have a different UI for nighttime than daytime, if that's set. I've only used a handful of these, but again, you have so much flexibility with this. And the whole idea is, is you can define a set of resources, like here's our string values, and then you can specify the circumstances which alternative values for those resources are available. All right. So we have that in, in three cases here. We have it with each three of these. We have our string values where we have an alternate resource based on language. We have a layout where we have an alternate resource based on the size of the screen. And then finally, our icons and images, we have alternate resources based on the um, screen density. All right? Questions about this? This is an XML file, all right? We talked a little bit about XML file. An XML file is a manner by which you can um, store the structure of any kind of data, all right? XML, the X in XML stands for extensible, you know, that you can extend it. You're able to extend it, all right? So what that means is XML itself isn't a language. XML is a, a, it's kind of a language that you can use to define other languages or you can define other formats in. 
So these are predefined things, resources, string names, just like A is a predefined tag in HTML, or P is a predefined tag in HTML, or head or header or IMG or whatever. So the idea is the same. There are tags that tell whoever is using this XML file what these values mean. And in this case, the string, the value of the string is between the start and end string tag. Just like in HTML, the value of a header, an H1 header, would be between the start and end H1 tag. All right. And the name is an attribute of that string. Remember, uh, an attribute in HTML is like additional information about a particular field, or a particular element, rather. All right. In this case, the name of this string element is hello. So we'll see later on when we look at the layout that that name of hello is used to pull out the value of that string, and that's how that value gets displayed. There are rules for every kind of XML file, like what you can have and what you can't have. Like, the, again, these are predefined. I can't just add, when, when it says extensible, it doesn't mean you can just like add whatever you want. It means that if you're developing an application, you can create your own XML format. So the rules of the XML format um, are defined, and so there's only certain things you can put into it. So, for example, in this case, if I went in here and I said, um, just put something in, at some point, maybe when I compiled it, it would tell me that that's uh, not allowable. Maybe. I don't know. Maybe it wouldn't. Maybe this is an exception where you do have that flexibility. Pro probably not, no. Right. right. The other XML file that we have is the layout file. And again, notice we have a resource qualifier on the layout, whereas we have a layout and a layout large. So a large screen gets the one layout, an ordinary size screen um, gets that. If you're not sure, gee, what does large mean? Well, that's where you re refer to the resource qualifiers. Screens are of similar size to a medium density VGA screen. The minimum layout for large screens is approximately 480 by 640. That's not really all that large, but you get the idea. All right. So we have a layout. And it's in an XML file. Again, we go and look at it. Oops. I'll bring it into maybe. Bring it into my text editor. All right. Relative layout, again, is sort of the root node of this one. You can have uh, a bunch of different kinds of layouts. The next example we'll have, we'll have a different kind of layout. All right. Then we have all our elements. And again, these are predefined. Text view, that's a, view, uh, a field that you can put text into, image views, and so on down the line. The attributes are what, again, connect this to other things. So for example, if we notice here, this text view, it says it gets the text from Android text at string welcome. What that is telling you is pull from the XML file, the string XML file, the string name that's called welcome. So in this case it would be, this one's called welcome, that's what it would put into there. All right. So that's how you link the string constants to your GUI. All right. There's rules about what's legit for this. 
Uh, we'll sort of evolve these as, as it goes, but for example, you have to specify certain attributes for certain elements. All right. If you say an image, you have to say where that image comes from and so on down the line. All right. A relative layout, again, is where you position things in relation to other things. So, for example, in this case, we have the text view that appears. We then define this image view, which contains the little robot guy, as being below that welcome text view. We also define for some of these, or for all of these elements, we define an ID. That defines a new ID. So the, it, that's assigning an ID of welcome text view to that top text view. Notice here, we don't have the plus sign. Why not? Because we're not defining a new ID, we're referencing an ID that's defined elsewhere. So that's why this has the plus sign and this doesn't have the plus sign. So in other words, when you're defining an ID for one of your form controls or one of your GUI controls, uh, views, all right, you put the at plus ID and then give the name that you want to give it. Yes? <laughs> okay. Well, now's as good a time uh, uh, as, as any. Notice that the size of this, the size of some of these things, Um, yeah. yeah, let's look at, at DP. All right, we all know what a pixel is, right? A pixel is a, a dot on the screen, all right? If I t said 10px there, it would do 10px do 10 pixels regardless of the screen density. Okay? So in other words, on a very dense screen, that 10px would be tiny. On a very undense screen, that 10px would be wide. So you have density independent pixels, which are either referred to as DP or DIP. All right? Probably too many people giggled when it was DIP, like dip, you know, in the road and all that. But um, so, that, so DP also refers to that. What does that mean? It means it will adjust that size depending on the screen density. And it adjusts it by the ratios that we defined before. All right. So, for example... Wow, I look like I'm ready here today, right? For, yeah. <laughs> so, for example, if I said 10 dp, that would mean on a medium density, it would be 10 pixels. So, this 10 dp is based on a medium density. All right? Because a medium density is defined as 160 pixels per inch. Low density is defined as 120, and high density is defined as 240. So, we can do the math and determine how big it would be on a high density and low density. A low density would be the 10 dp times 120 over 160, which is 3 fourths, so it would be 7 and a half, so either 7 or 8 pixels. I honestly have no clue if it would round up or round down. It does one of them, because near as I know, you can't have half a pixel. All right? HD, on the other hand, would be times 240 over 160, which would be 3 over 2, which would be 15. 
All right, so it would be 15 pixels. And, in, and what that's telling you is that 10 pixels medium spaced, let's say this is medium, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, will be the same physical size as 7 pixels that are widely spaced. All right, approximately. All right. And it will be the same size approximately as 15 pixels that are very tightly spaced. So. DP is. DP is used along with the screen density of the particular device to translate into actual pixels. All right, so if you want to consider that like a ratio, yeah, it gets it gets prorated, if you will, times the the how the screen density relates to a medium density. Here's a question I guarantee will be on one of the quizzes. It might even be on a bunch of quizzes. And the reason it's in there is it took me so long to 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 get this through my own head. All right, because this is a little tricky. You know, you don't have this sort of thing in, in like web development, for example. You know, a pixel's a pixel, all right, in web development. The question is, is I, if I make an image that's 100 dp, how big is it going to be on a medium density device? 100. Yep. Because medium density device is the baseline that are used for determining the size. So when I say 100 dp, 100 dp essentially means 100 pixels on a medium device, uh, medium, medium density device. And so now the other ones you'd have to do some math, right? So from 100 pixel uh, uh, image would be then three quarters of 100 pixels or 75 pixels on a low density machine because the pixels again are spaced out and it would be 150 pixels on a high density device. Then you go from there, extra high density and so on down the line. All right. But, oh really? <laughs> well, that would be, that would fall into one of these categories then. Yeah, there's like, oh. Uh, extra high density, or extra high density is approximately 320. Extra, extra is 480. And extra, extra, extra is 640. Well, again, it's an approximate because it's not quite the other one either, right? So it's kind of going to have to decide what category you fit into, all right? Again, so these things are approximate, you know, depending on the exact density, unless it happens to hit one of those benchmarks exactly, all right? Now, SP, one second, we also see SP in here. somewhere right here. SP is more or less the same, but it takes into account the font size of the font that you have set on your phone. So like for text, for typically, if you're talking about like images or spaces or whatever, you will use um, DP. If you are talking about like the size of some kind of text, you use SP, because SP also takes into account the font, the font size um, that it's set by. Question. All right. Last but not least, we have the actual Java code itself, which in this case is real, real, real simple. We have an on create, we have an activity. 
First of all, we define what package it belongs in. All your classes belong to a package. Typically, you use what's this, this like reverse URL approach where, you know, Deedle.com is the name of their website. So it starts out with com, goes to Deedle, and then in this case, they group their everything in their welcome application into one package. Um, it's not like it goes out to that website and gets anything. It's just there to guarantee uniqueness. All right. In other words, what else is there in the world that's unique but a URL? All right. How many organizations have Deedle.com as their web address? Only one. All right. There, there aren't two Deedle.coms. One here and one in Canada or something like that. So therefore, this guarantees that each package gets a unique name by using the URL. So since you're control over your stuff, you'll make sure that like the rest of this is, you know, is, uh, is unique. So you won't have two packages called welcome or anything like that. So like what I typically do in this class is I do edu.lorainecc something else because again that would you know that should be unique because there's only one Lorraine CCC.edu. We import you import the classes that you are going to use and again in this very minimal case we're importing the um, activity and the bundle. You actually don't have to import but if you don't import what you have to do is you have to refer to the class by its complete name. So for example, the bundle class's actual full name is android.os.bundle. Well, that would be a pain in the butt to type in every single time you want to refer to a class. Likewise, activity is android.app activity. So by importing that, what you're doing is you're telling the compiler like where to find these classes. The bundle that I want is in the Android OS bundle that's part of the Android framework. Now you could imagine, all right, and again, this gets into like namespaces and package names and all that. Again, this is to guarantee uniqueness, all right. For example, my developers developing an Android application might have their own bundle class. If they're talking about selling bundles of firewood, for example, or, or something like that. All right. How would you differentiate between the Android one and your bundle class? Well, your bundle class would be there, you'd have a different package name associated with it. So you could then theoretically use both of them. All right. All this does, public class, again, public means the outside world can see it. Class means it's a class. This is the name of the class, welcome. If you remember, this corresponds to what we saw in the manifest as the activity associated with this class. So this is a guy that's going to run when the application fires off. This part is important, extends activity. We'll talk a little bit more about object-oriented stuff and all this. Essentially, extending means it inherits from. Another way to say it is this welcome class is a kind of Android activity. Whenever we talk about inheritance, we talk about like is a, you know, I-S space A, is a. So I could say, for example, a dog is a mammal. So if I was creating a, a zoo application, I could have the dog class inherit from the mammal class. All right. I could say that a car and a car is a vehicle. A motorcycle is a vehicle. So if I had a vehicle class, I could inherit motorcycle and inherit automobile from the vehicle class. Now what I couldn't do is if I had engine, and I couldn't say like engine is an automobile, because an engine isn't an automobile, it's part of an automobile. So really the way to tell 
when, if something inherits, is to try to form an is a statement. And if you can, then it's possibly good inheritance. There's other tests as well, but that's the first step. If the answer is no, then no, don't inherit it. But in this case, what fires up the first time that you create, uh, first time that you run this app, has to be an activity. So this welcome class has to be an activity. So it has to extend activity in some shape or form. All right? Now, the other thing that we have to do is we have to write code to sort of customize it because there's generic code in the framework that does certain things like when the application starts, when the application stops, and so on. We want to make sure this does what we want it to do, not what any generic activity does. So in this case, we override the onCreate method. All right? The onCreate method runs, obviously, when the application is first run. It runs some other times, too, but it definitely runs when the application first runs. So we need this. The first thing that we do, super dot on create. What does the super mean here? Does that mean that we really want to make sure we do a great job on this code or what? Yeah. Super on create means call your ancestor class, call your parent classes on create method. Because when we define our own on create, we override the over create, uh, uh, the on create on the super class, the class that's above it. All right. So in activity, there's some code that runs when an activity is created. We want that code. We also want our own code. So we have to tell it to run the code that's built into the framework whenever an activity is created, and this line does it. If I'm not mistaken, this has to be, this might have to be the first line in it. I, I think you'd get in trouble if it wasn't the first line. All right. I can't think of a case where you would want it to be anything but the first line, but <laughs> just put it in the first line, right? Because I said so. <laughs> All right. The next one sets the content view. And what do you suppose that does? That, that pops up the screen associated with this activity. Well, what's the screen? The screen from the resource section, from the layout section, that is called main. So resource section, layout section, called main. So that's the one that we get. Now, again, we don't have to code anything in here that says for a large screen go and put this other main file or if it's French use the values from the values.fr or whatever. All right, because that's built in the Android framework. Android's smart enough to do that for you. We simply say I want from the resources the main XML and Android will figure out which main XML applies to this particular situation. All right, so that's cool. We don't have to code anything for that. It does it by itself. Questions over this? I, I know I'm kind of probably kind of repeating myself, but I think it's important. I think it's important right off the bat we're familiar with where this stuff lives before we look at even more complicated examples. So let's look at a slightly more complicated example. All right, let's look at a tip calculator. And here it is. Let's run it on our handy little Android device.
All right. Again, I have to do the goofy thing of unplugging this and plugging it back in. I have no idea why. Now my device is available. If you don't have an actual Android device, you can run it on an emulator. And there's a discussion in the book, I believe, on how to create an emulator. All right. The thing I've experienced is, at least on my machine, it takes forever to run anything in an emulator. So I virtually always use this. If you don't have an Android device, you can use an Android device um, in lab. All right, so I pick my Sa uh, Samsung device and click OK. It will run it. By the way, if you notice when I first went into this, when I first opened up, it clicks over these red X's. It really was still thinking about if these were valid programs or not. It, there wasn't any problems because if you notice, the red X's went away. All right. And I can get a compile. Right, right. Well, yeah, that's 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 true. That's true. <laughs> what? <laughs> I thought we did. Oh, okay. I was going to say. The rover's up there. That's true. They got stuff. Oh, okay. Oh, I don't know. Supposedly. Yeah. Supposedly it's there. Yeah, they found the one and only possible. Online. Just practice that. Just got to get Okay, here, here we have this. And I'm going to zoom in so we can see it. This is a real simple tip calculator. And there's a place to. Put in the amount. So we can put in that, let's say our bill was $100. There's a place to put, select whether the service was poor, average, or excellent. We'll pick average. And there's a button to calculate the tip, and it shows that for 15%. All right. If it's poor, calculate the tip. It gives, still gives a 10% tip, I don't, or $10 tip. I don't know if, if if that's really true. I guess it depends on how poor it was, you know. And excellent, it gives a 20% uh, tip. All right. So that's how this behaves. You see, we got a lot more stuff in this one than we had in the last one, right? We have different kinds of controls. We don't have text controls. Uh, or we don't have only text controls and images. We have a text area that you can input into. We have a spinner control where you can choose between a list of options. All right? So there'll be some new stuff in here that wasn't in the other one. All right? One thing I want to note is notice that when you're in the simple tack, uh, tip calculator that only the numbers are enabled. So I can't put in a, a value of um, Fred or something like that. I have to put in a number. Okay, so let's go and let's look at this. And I have posted this example to Angel, by the way. And um, I mentioned that if you don't have the file, you could email me. The other thing you could do is you could just use this example and get it up and running on one of your machines and give me a screenshot of it. All right, let's look at this one. If we look at example, we'll see we have the same things. We have our Android manifest, which really doesn't have a lot in it has pretty much the same thing that was in the other one. That is, defines the icon. The label comes from the string file. The name of the activity is example activity, which corresponds to the name of my Java class. OK, just like the welcome did, and so on. So nothing new in the manifest. Let's look at my resources. Now, my resources are actually a little simpler in this case. I don't use any resource qualifiers. Okay? So I don't have, I don't think, no. I don't have any for an alternate language or an alternate screen size. I lied, though. I actually do use a resource qualifier. I use a resource qualifier for 
the icon, the only image here. And again, there are three icon files and the file will be used depending on the screen density and it will be in those ratios. So an icon, this icon, if I double click on it and preview it, an icon on a medium density will be blah, 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 48 pixels by 48. So what would a low density be? Three quarters of that. <laughs> 36. And sure enough, if we look, it is 36. And what will high density be? 72. High density is easy if you calculate low density because a high density is twice the size of a, of a low density. So this is going to be 72 because the low density was 36. All right, fair enough. So again, we define the icon. So not much to do there. Our values should be something new in here. An array. So the rest of the stuff is the same. I originally had something else in for breakfast, whereas that's no longer in the app, so we could get rid of that. But the rest of the string variables are the same as were in the previous example. The difference is I now have a string array. I give that string array a name, and then I have items for that correspond to the different options that I want to choose from. And I have the prompt that corresponds to what's going to display when I show the list of these options. So if we're going to look at this again, the prompt, choose level of service, the three options, poor, average, and excellent. All right. And if we look, all of these things we can find somewhere in that strings file. Example, simple tip calculator is under the app name. Simple tip calculator that displays on the top of it, underneath the title bar is there. What else we have? We had the um, items that are in the spinner control. They're in the array and the prompt is in the string name. And then finally the label for the button, calculate tip, is in the string name calculate. Alright? So, again, were I to want to make a Spanish version or a French version or whatever, I would simply duplicate that folder, duplicate the string file, and I'd keep the name the same, but I would change the value to be the Spanish language. Remember, the code is the only one that sees a name. There's, there's a really bad practice on the stage, though. What's that? You have like three different codes. Re Repeat that, please. Yeah. String dash array, I have no choice about. Yeah, that's what I mean. Like, yeah, that's part of, no that's part of the, the Android framework. So I am innocent of that one. <laughs> all right? I am guilty of this one. I should not mix that with that. You're right. So that sh I, should make, I should put the underscore for all of them or use a camel case for, for that one. So I'll plead guilty to a lesser charge in this case. Yeah, it uses the array to, to enumerate the choices that you have, and the prompt is what appears on the top to explain what those choices mean. Um, 
could use a big question. Could you? Yeah, you could. But it wouldn't be a good idea because then you'd have to go, uh, you'd have to write the code to populate this. All right? When we look at the layout, we'll simply see that, hey, the spinner control gets populated from this array. All right? And if you add something to the array, I guess I add to the spinner control. If you did it by hand, you'd sort of have to programmatically go and you'd have to write code to go and do this. So I, I wouldn't see any advantage to doing that. The only way I would see an advantage of doing that would be if you had something where the spinner was dynamic. In other words, the spinner didn't always offer the same number of options. Yeah, that would be, that would be one example. If you're pulling values from a database, that would be one example. Or, again, sometimes you have, let's say we're doing an application that says, um, you know, find our office, right, or whatever. And there might be, like if you pick Ohio, there might be a Lorraine and a Columbus office. If you pick Michigan, there might be a Detroit and a Lansing office. So it's when, like, the, the, when a choice in one spinner controls the choice of a second one, then maybe you do something like that. But that probably would come from a database and would probably be handled differently anyhow. Typically, yeah, it's going to be an array. All right. Let's look at the layout now. And the layout, Doesn't seem to. All right. What's the first thing we see different about this? What's different about this line? It's a linear layout as opposed to relative layout. So your layout file it needs your your, your UI layout file needs some kind of layout. You have to tell it how the things are going to be oriented on the screen, how the things are going to be organized. The first example, it was said relative layout. And relative layout is where you define where one thing is in relation to another thing. You say that this thing is below this, this other thing, or this thing's above this other thing, or to the right, or to the left, or whatever. In a linear layout, it's literally one thing, two things, three things, four things that go just in a straight line. All right, and you can orient it horizontally or you can orient it vertically. All right, in this case, if we look at this, it's a linear layout where text, text entry, spinner, button, label. All right, just there's five things and they're all in a straight line and they're all vertically. Now, keep in mind that this is one of those things like, is almost like HTML, right? You can have um, layouts within layouts. So, for example, if I wanted to put a list of three images at the bottom here, all right, I could actually put within my linear layout that was vertical, sort of a sublinear layout that was horizontal, and put image one, two, and three. And it would lay that whole layout right there, and within that little mini area, it would be oriented horizontally. So this is like mix and match any way you want to. You know, within one layout, you can have another layout, and you can nest these things to get exactly the kind of layout you want. At first, this seems like, when you see these things, it seems pretty simplistic. Like, you know, geez, you know, I have to put everything in a straight line. Well, when we start adding things in, all right, and nesting things and things like that, you do have a lot of flexibility of how this is going to work. All right, text view. 
30 SP. All right, remember SP is like DP, except it's for fonts. Where does the text come from? It comes from at string hello. So it comes from my string file under the name hello. Takes a, it, it takes it whatever its parent is. So in the case of linear layout, the parent is the whole screen, so that would be yes. There's one text view. Here's the, no, here's oh, the ending tag for it. So like if I wanted another text view, do I have to put another text view or can I just declare it from that same one? No, no, if I had like one input for name, one input for last first name, and one input for name. Yes. Right. Can I put them both in that one edit text, or do I have to create another edit text? You'd have to create two edit texts. So each one is its own object? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And that would be consistent with web development, too. If you did that, you'd have two that's text what, boxes. Yeah. I didn't know if those were like declaration blocks for each. Right. This is an edit text field, so this allows me to enter in. That's the difference between this and that. Notice I have at plus ID amount, okay? Remember, you use the plus ID when you're defining an ID for an element. So I'm defining this element's ID and its amount. You don't use the plus when you're referring to it elsewhere. All right. Now, layout width 100 dp. Input type is number. That's why if you remember, when we go into that field, we can't type in any letters. We said it's a number. Um, the text size is 30 SP, again. And finally, we have request focus. And what that does is that puts your cursor in that field. So if you had like a form for them to fill out and there were five or six fields, you could put it in the field that you wanted to start them out in. Otherwise, Android's going to do something by default, right? And you don't know what it's going to do, so if you want it to have focus, then explicitly say request focus. Question. This might take a little bit of, of forethought or seeing the future. We'll see if we have any psychics in this class. I don't know. Maybe, I'm not sure if I asked a similar question last time or not. Why does this guy have an ID and this guy not have an ID? Yeah, because we're going to write code to access this. And therefore, we're going to need to be able to point to that edit text field and pull the amount out so that we can do the tip calculation. What? Pardon me? Yep. Yeah, this guy doesn't need anyone because we are not manipulating that at all. All right, yes. Well, the input type prevents you from entering it. So, what? I, uh, no. Um, yeah, I don't. I don't think so. Could you somehow cram a non-numeric field into here? All right, here's your spinner control. It also has an ID. Why? Because we're going to need to pull the value from that spinner control to know what percentage to charge. All right. Has an entries, which it gets from an array. It has a prompt, which it gets from the prompt. So those two things come from the screen, or I'm sorry, from the values um, XML file. We have a button, 
All right. I guess this text from Calculate is ID is Calc. Why? Because we have to know when that button's pressed. So we have to we have to know something about that button. And then finally, we have our text view where we're going to put the result. Any questions about any of this? Yes. For uh, like styling, you know, it's probably getting a little ahead of it. So for styling, do you have to declare it by ID or can I just fill in all the text boxes to have green letters on can I just do text equals green? That do individual There is another way to do that. You can define um yeah, you, you can define, um, just like you can define a strings XML file, you can define a styles XML file. And you can give names to your styles. And then you can say, this text box use style A, this text box use style A, this text box use style A. In a way, yeah. Where do you see that? Oh, in quotation marks. Yeah, yeah I was going to say, I don't see any parentheses here. Uh, you know, this is my Friday, by the way. This is my last class of the week. Uh, the first week is always a little brutal. All right. I mean, not like in a horrible way, but it's always a little tougher than, you know, just getting back in the swing of things. But I'm like sitting here like, hmm. But yes, any, anything after the equal sign will be in quotes. Correct. That's like a rule of XML. All right. Okay. Now, this is where the fun starts. Are you with me so far? Do you have any questions? The specific values of the properties, no, you'll look them up or you'll, you'll refer to an example or something like that. I don't expect you to, yeah, to, to know all the properties for this. Yeah. Yeah, right, right, right. Um, I expect you to know that, gee, these views have properties and these properties describe like how big it's going to be, properties uh, you assign an ID to it. In some cases, the properties define where it gets its value from and things like that. But believe me, if you, getting back to the, the shooting thing, if you held a gun to my head right now and asked me to code a Android text view off the top of my head, I probably couldn't come up with every property without like looking it up. So, do, I, yes, I do. Um, I did a small one for Duck Radio. Uh, that's probably my most recent one. Um, that's what, yeah, uh, I did a couple others, but those were when I was just was playing. So search Duck Radio. That one I actually did with XML5, or I'm sorry, HTML5. And it is a real simple app just to play, the, and it has some links on it and all that. So Duck Radio. Um, our college radio station is called Duck Radio. Yeah. And, and I have a show on Duck Radio. So I have to have two shows on Duck Radio. So What's there the you go. I'm on Fridays from 10 to noon and Saturdays from 10 to noon. And we have to play the station's format for at least an hour. So there are certain kinds of songs that they play, like like typically like yeah, like you'd hear on. I don't know, 106.5 or something like that, yeah. Uh, so I have to play that. So usually, usually I play like classic-ish rock for, for that. That's the, and and if, if there's a pop tune I happen to like, I, I play that. The Saturday show, I play what I feel like playing, which is a lot of jazz, some classical. I was told one time what I played, they thought maybe there was a problem with the transmitter or something. Uh, but um, that's like kind of a free form show where I, I, it's more like what I would say would be like the classic college radio where like you have no idea is the guy going to play a polka next or is he going to play death metal, you know, that kind of thing. 
Uh, a lot of people, a lot of people have said, thought that I like did a tech show. It's like, why, why would I want to, after working all week, go and <laughs> for recreation, go and talk about this stuff? If you call in a request and request a question, I would answer it. I'll give you, I'll give you that. <laughs> Yeah, a lot, a lot of them are. That, that is true. A lot of them are. Okay. I want to at least look at the Java code here. Because there's a lot more going on in the Java code here uh, than in the previous example. Obviously, because it's doing some calculation. It's not just displaying a screen. Okay. That is an excellent question. The assumption is, is that is, is uh, Java, I almost said Jazz is not a prerequisite. <laughs> it ought to be, all right? Uh, Java is not a prerequisite for this class. That's why we will spend some time next week like practicing up some Java just to get us through that. So you, that should not be a problem if you're taking Java concurrently. The, the problem is, is you know, you sh a, a person is supposed to be able to complete an associate's degree in, in two years, all right, if they go full time. Right. Now, the problem is, is if we were to put in like a lot of prerequisites and the prerequisites that we would want to, it would be great because we could assume certain things and all that. But the problem would be is to get through X number of courses, it would take you... 10 years because course A depends on course B and course B depends on course C and so on down the line. So yeah, so we're, yeah, we're limited into uh, that. So we're encouraged not to have like excessive prerequisites. All right, here's the package which I created using again the reverse URL method, edu, Lorraine CCTC. And I got the course number wrong, CISS 268. This is 265, but that's OK. Here's my imports of the stuff that I need to import. All right. I had a checkbox in an earlier version of this. So I, I could probably get rid of that. No, you don't. Right off the bat, we see a tiny little difference. My activity extends activity which the other one did too. The difference is where it says it implements view.onClickListener. Okay? This is a case, whenever you see implement, it means it can serve the role of. It's kind of an isa, but it's a weaker isa. All right? Yeah, I probably lost everyone. I even confused myself a little bit on that one. Okay, why not make it another ISA? Because you can only inherit from one class. All right, there is no multiple inheritance in Java. Now you can inherit a chain, so class A can inherit from class B, and class B can inherit from class C, and class C can inherit from class D, it's like in a chain. So like there's like the child, the father, the grandfather, the great-grandfather, like that. So you can, so like you could have animals as uh, the top class. You could have mammals inherit from animals. You could have dogs inherit from mammals. You could have uh, poodles inherit from dogs, and so on down the line. That's legit, but in each case, there's only one superclass. You can't have multiple inheritance, where it's both a dog and a pet, for example, if you had, let's say, a pet class. You couldn't make up it so that a poodle was inherits from dog and inherits from pet. You can't do that. So what do you do? Well, you figure out what something more meaningfully is. And this is an activity. This has to be an activity, right, for it to pop up. As sort of a secondary thing, it is also an on-click listener. It serves in that role. Let me give you an example of this. 
What are some things that fly? There's a birds fly, insects, planes, time flies, dragons fly, uh, kites fly, helicopters fly, and all that. Now, if we were creating an inheritance structure, we might want to have an inheritance structure where we had animals, birds, parakeets, eagles, that kind of thing. All right? But there may be certain things that we want to ask every flying thing to do. All right? For example, what are some things that we could ask of every flying thing? We could ask, what's your maximum height? Right? What's the maximum height that you could fly a kite? I don't know. There's probably an answer somewhere. Probably, you know, might depend on some calculation of like how big the kite is, what the wind speed is, whatever. How much string you have. Right, right. All right. What's the average height of a bir uh, bird can fly? That probably depends on the species of bird, maybe the age of the bird, and maybe the gender of the bird. I don't know. All right, there's factors that determine how high a certain bird can fly. All right, how high can a plane fly? Well, that depends on the kind of plane, the kind of engine, maybe the kind of fuel, I don't know. These are all different questions that I might want to ask flying things if I had an application that dealt with flying things. They're going to be answered in totally different ways. And they're not really, in each of these flying things isn't related to each other in any way except that they can serve the role of a flying thing. And I might want to ask the flying thing certain questions. All right? When you have a situation like that, you can't use multiple inheritance. So, I might do something like this. All right. Could have something like this. Right? An animal, a bird, and an eagle. An eagle inherits from bird. And again, let's be clear what we mean when I say it inherits. When I say it inherits, it means that the is a statement is true. An eagle is a bird. A bird is an animal. What that means is it does all the things that a bird does, plus it might do some eagle-y kind of things. All right? A parakeet does everything a bird can do, plus it can do some parakeet things, all right, uh, and so on down the line. Birds do everything animals do, plus it do, they do some bird-like things, all right? So that's what it means when it says we inherit. So you sort of get all the functionality of the level above, but you might have some extra functionality, and you might do some things in a little bit different way. Yes? Yes, it does. Yes, it does. It's a chain. Bird gets everything from animal. Eagle gets everything from bird. So by implication, eagle gets every or bird gets every eagle gets everything from animal as well. Now, and again, don't ask me what I'm, I'm application I'm writing where I'm keeping track of birds and, and airplanes and kites. All right, the duck radios app exactly. I might then have a vehicle and an airplane. And then a jet. All right. A jet isn't a bird. All right. A jet isn't an animal. All right. In fact, if you looked at an eagle, you'd be more apt to describe it that it's a bird instead of saying, that's a thing that flies. Right? It is a thing that flies, but in terms of behavior and in terms of what it's more like, eagles have more in common with birds than eagles have with other flying things. Okay? So therefore, 
we would inherit maybe this way. Yes. Okay. We would inherit maybe this way, where we had a vehicle, an airplane, and jet. Now, if there was some case of having a wanting to keep track of and wanting to be able to do something with any flying things, we could create an interface. And that's usually shown on a uh, an OO diagram as a dotted line. And that interface would be flying thing. What else flies? Bats fly, right? So even other kinds of animals fly. Couldn't put flying thing on birds because even if you were just considering um, animals and forgetting about airplanes and all that, because bats also fly. Yes? We're talking about implements. Yes. Yes. So, this is sort of the main is a. Uh, this, uh, this one is a kind of is a. Uh, <laughs> can be thought of as a. Um, you, could, you could view it that way. All right share some characteristics with, or share some behaviors with, is probably, but not all. But share some specific behaviors that we are interested in. All right? And another way to say it is that it serves the role as. It can fit in the role of a flying thing. All right? It implements the interface. All right? An interface is, instead of, you saw in our example so far, we said public class. Instead of saying public class, if we were creating our own interface, we'd say public interface. Okay? So we would be creating an interface instead of a class. In our case here, the view on ClickListener is already defined for us. So we don't define that. That's built in the Android framework. So, oh, crap. Well, we'll get to that in a second, as soon as I stop hitting the wrong buttons here. <laughs> View on click listener. What does that mean? What is an on click listener? It, go ahead. Yeah, it handles, it listens for, it handles when buttons get clicked. Or really when, a, when any view gets clicked. But in our case, it's a button. In this case, it's looking, we'll, we'll see where it comes into play in a second here. All right, because there are other, to handle like any touch, there's other ways of doing that. All right. Now, notice what we're doing here. We do the same thing that we did in previous examples. Super on, on the on create, we have super on create. We set the content view to the main. So this is exactly what we did in the Hello World application. Here's where we do more. This is a key statement. What this is doing is this is finding the button on the screen. All right? I'm going to go a little over today. Well, I've already gone a little over today, but I'll continue to go a little over. All right? For maybe another five minutes, depending on questions. All right? This finds the button on the screen and stores a pointer to the button in this variable. All right? So this button calc finds the button on the screen and stores a reference to that button, a pointer to the button, in the variable calc. I created a local variable that points to that button on the screen. Yes. Button is a data type. Let's break this down. All right. Alternatively, I could have done it this way.
button calc is my data declaration. I have a variable named calc, and I want it to point to a button. What do I mean by buttons? Well, I'm importing the Android widget called buttons, so that's what I mean when I say a button. What does calc equal to? And again, when we talk about objects and object references, when we say it equals something, we mean it's going to be pointing to an object. All right? Well, we're going to find the thing on the page that has an ID of calc. All right? So, I'm going to build this instruction here. Find view by ID, R ID calc. What that does is that looks in this UI and looks for the thing that has an ID of calc. Well, which thing has an ID of calc? Ah, the button has an ID of calc. <coughs> To use the same names as what? Oh, I think it's good, but it's your choice. Yeah, I don't find Deedle particularly funny. I don't know. Paul probably has a different sense of humor than me, though. All right, find view by ID finds the thing on the page that has that as the ID. All right? And it points to it. So now calc is pointing to the thing on our screen that has the ID of calc. Now, the last part, button. What does that do? What is that called, this little? It's a cast, all right? We know it's a button, right? We know that the thing with an ID of calc is a button, all right? How do we know that? Well, because we went and look, and we wrote this application, right? So we know, yeah, that thing called calc is a button. Does it know it's a button? Not really, because if you look at this method, this method says find view by ID. All right? It doesn't say find button by ID. It doesn't say find image by ID. Find view by ID. We can use it to find any view we want to on that page. So this method is not going to give me a button. It's going to give me a view. Now, a view is a kind of button. I'm sorry, other way around. A button is a kind of view and so on and so forth, but it doesn't know, the compiler doesn't know that this is a button unless we say, hey, I know this is a button. I rigged the deck. So therefore, this view that you're giving me here, that you found, I know it's a button, and what's more, I want to treat it like a button. I want to do buttony things to it. All right? Therefore, it has to be defined as a button. Because if it's not defined as a button, I can only do view things to it. Here, here's why we have to do both. We declare it as a button because we want to treat it as a button. All right? This returns a view. Can you put a view into a button? No, you can't. It would blow up because of, there are views that aren't buttons. So it would blow up in that case. So we have to tell it, hey, I know it's a button, so it's okay to put that button. That view that you found, I know is a button, so it's okay to put that button in this button variable. So Treat it like it's a button. Use a generic placeholder for 
Repeat that. Find view by ID finds views, finds any kind of view. And again, gets back to an inheritance, er, inheritance thing. All these things are views. Now, I'm not sure exactly what the inheritance structure is, but under view, we have text view, image view, button. Pretty much anything we can put on the screens of view. Spinner. Spinner, exactly. So, find view by ID finds the view that has that ID. It, so it doesn't really know what type you want until you tell it, hey, this, by the way, is a button. All right. Now, here's the last thing that we'll cover today. And again, I could go another... I feel like, like Bruce Springsteen or the Grateful Dead or something. I could go another two hours, you know, if needed. The, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, this again is a leftover from an old, old version of this. Okay. And again, getting back to the original question, this just does this all on one line. So this sort of mashes that together into one line. Yeah, the declaration and the assignment. Now, so now we know calc is pointing to that button. And everyone <laughs> concerned, me and the compiler, knows that it's a button. So what we have to do is we have to say, who is going to handle when this button gets clicked? Who has the code to handle this? Well, who has the code to handle this? The button handler has it. The on-click handler has it. Who is the on-click handler? Or the on-click listener or handler? This, ob this class itself is the on-click handler. So I therefore say, hey, this class, the class that we're in, is going to handle the clicking of this button. All right. What does it mean to say that it's going to handle the clicking of the button? What does it mean to serve in the role of a on-click listener? What does it mean to implement the interface of an on-click listener? What it means is you have to have all the methods that are defined for an on-click listener. There's only one method defined for an on-click listener. And what do you suppose that is? On click. Right. So in other words, in order to make this an on click listener, we have to define a method called on click. Doesn't matter what that method does, we have to have one. If we don't have one, then we're not allowed to consider it an on click listener. In my previous example, if I define that a flying thing has a maximum height and a maximum speed, I can't consider something a flying thing unless I have a method to calculate the maximum height and a method to calculate the maximum speed. Now that method may vary from different flying things. For birds it might be the wingspan and the weight and things like that. All right. For an airplane, it might be how many engines it has and what kind of fuel it has and so on. But it would have to have a calculate maximum height, calculate speed. Well, with an on-click listener, there's only one method it needs. It needs the method to handle when that button gets clicked. So, in a nutshell, we point to the button. We tell the button that this class itself is going to contain the code that processes when that button gets clicked. And because we said this is implementing the on-click listener, we have to supply the on-click method. And the on-click method is what actually does the math and goes and does this. Yes? Uh, is that an argument? Is which an argument? Uh, the? Yeah. 
what I'm doing is this is going to automatically get called by virtue of this being an on-click listener and all that when it's clicked. And the view V will get passed to it saying which view got clicked. Because imagine for a second we had three or four buttons on here. All right? We'd need to know which button we clicked. So we'd have to test that view variable because this method would get called and would pass which button got clicked. So we could have some tests to determine, hey, was it button A, button B, button C that got clicked? For a single button, this is automatically For a single button, this view that gets passed in is always going to be that button. And we don't have to worry about it, right? Because I know there's only one button, there's only one thing this is the on-click listener for, all right? And therefore, I don't have to, if it gets into this method, it means that button got clicked. So I go and do the things I want to do when that button got clicked. And that's where we will, unfortunately, unless we want to convert people in North Ridgeville to learning the Android class uh, without, their <laughs> without them wanting to, all right, uh, we, uh, that's where I'll end today. You can download this example and look at it uh, if you want. What we'll pick up next time is we'll review this. I understand this could be tricky. So if it's still a little fuzzy, we'll come back to it on Tuesday. Believe me, if you understand this method and all that, you're, in really, you're, you're, you're moving into being in really good shape because part, you know, the biggest challenge in writing like component-based software like this is getting things to talk to each other. How do we get the user interface to talk to the code that's actually doing the processing? All right? And that's what we're taking steps to do here. Yes? No. No, I, no, no in the sense I can't go it over real quick. So just for now, just realize that that is there and, and, and it's, you have to have that argument and we'll talk about that some other time. All right. Next time we'll pick up on what happens when we actually click it. All right. Okay. Any questions? All righty.